All right, welcome back, Chaotically Tolerant, episode 172, I think. Um, we're going to do some grids today, baseball again. Um, we are officially, there is football this week. There is football on this week. So we've made it, you know, like real, somewhat regular season football. We have the the uh, Ireland game, I think, in college football. It's Florida State, Georgia Tech. But big week. Make sure to like, comment, subscribe, and let's jump into it. Mike, so we're going to start off with the NFL. Um, the Commanders named Jane Daniels their starter today. I think anyone really could have guessed that, right? Like they're they're not rolling with Marcus Mariota over the Heisman winner. No way, no way. Yeah, why not? I mean, they're they're in a full blown rebuild. They had a horrible defense last year, so they just need a spark. And and you know, I think he's looked pretty solid early on. I mean, a long way to go, but. Look good in his preseason debut, I thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's um, definitely, you know, not he's he's not like a scrub. He's he's. I don't think I think some people expected him to come in a little more raw than than what he's shown. So he's looked pretty good, and Commanders fans can be somewhat comfortable, a little comfortable, right? <laughs> yeah, you're never I mean, comfortable you with a with a rookie. You can't be any but, worse than last year, and Sam Howell getting sacked 155 times or whatever. Yeah. Tua calls out Brian Flores for his uh, coaching style. I don't know if you saw this. He was on a podcast and he said, and I quote, where is the quote? To put it in simplest terms, if you woke up every morning and I told you that you suck at what you did, that you don't belong doing what you do, that you shouldn't be here, that this guy should be here and you haven't earned this right. And then you have someone else come in and tell you, dude, you are the best fit for this. He said in the interview, how would it make you feel listening to one or the other? You see what I'm saying? I don't know. That was a weird, weird quote, the way he said that. And then you hear it, no matter what it is, the good or the bad, you hear it more and more. You start to believe it, that I don't care who you are. You could be the president of the United States. You have a terrible person telling you things that you don't want to hear or probably shouldn't be hearing. You're going to start believing that about yourself. And so that's what sort of ended up happening. It was basically, it's been two, uh, what, two years of training that out of me now, uh, but just a couple of guys as well, uh, blah, blah, blah. Basically, he's calling out Brian Flores saying, dude, you were kind of a prick to me, basically. You, you were just telling me I constantly wasn't good enough. Uh, and imagine, you know, you got to think, you got to put yourself into a situation at that point. He's coming off that, that really bad hip injury. Um, he's having, you know, dealing with injuries. Um, going into that season, I think there was already a lot of questions in the media. Brian Flores clearly was not just not the guy to, to coach the best out of him. And you can say what you want about Tua. What quarterback are you going to be able to get right now or within, you know, the at least the last two off seasons that's better than Tua? I mean, that is a weird quote. That sounds, sounds like a guy that's had 11 concussions or something. But, I, um... I really feel like I was having a stroke trying to read it. I was like, this – really is a, a hard quote to read <laughs> pretty incoherent yeah uh, i mean at this point they have oh what i think is a is a potentially a really good offense but not necessarily the offense that's built to win in january per se but you know i mean remember when they ran up 70 points against denver that was last year right or was that the year before yeah that was last year it feels like five years ago right right i mean like <laughs> they they have arguably the best receiver in football to throw to. Um, but yeah, boy, I mean, Flores, and maybe that would explain why after a great finish to the 21 season, um, people were surprised that Flores got let go. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if I would assume, I mean, Tua has never been a guy to create drama, I think in, in the media. So I would assume what he's saying is somewhat correct. And uh, if that is true, obviously, that's just crazy. I mean, a, a coach telling you you just constantly suck after, you know, people were saying he's soft for for saying this. He was with Nick Saban. He was he was under Nick Saban in college. Nick Saban is notoriously one of the hardest coaches 
to ever play under. It's Bill and and Nick Saban, those two guys, at least in recent history. So I don't think the guy's soft. I think he just finally had enough. Like eventually, if you're in the pros, you're being told you're not good enough. Yeah, you start to believe it. That's what he was saying in the quote. It was just, I think the way he said it was probably different because he said it the way he wanted to say it. Um, That's a quote probably shouldn't be written out. But uh, yeah, it's, you really can't blame the guy. And I hope he has a great year. I've always kind of rooted for the guy. Not, again, I'm a two anon fan. I've uh, always wanted him to succeed. So, really, just bizarre that a, that an NFL coach would be saying that to your young, your young first round draft pick. You would think you would want to instill confidence in the kid, even if you didn't like him. Right. Right. Yeah. Very strange. Yeah. And then uh, here's one really odd one that came out today: Goster Cherilis was arrested today, former first round pick of the Lions for urinating on a flight. So mm. uh, really urinating on someone on a flight. It's not like he just got arrested for going to the bathroom and in the plane. He urinated on someone. So uh, really just bizarre. I, I don't even know if you remember. I, I, I had never even heard of this name and he played for the Colts. Um, I don't know if you remember who this guy was. Uh, I do. I think he may have also played for the Broncos, if I'm not mistaken. But... Was he in... Lions, Colts, and Bucks. I do, I do know the name. I do recall him playing. Uh, he was on. That means he was a rookie on the 08 winless Lions. So um, maybe he was taking out some frustration on somebody. I don't. Maybe someone made a joke about the 0 16 Lions to him, and he took offense to it. I don't know. That is. A, it's a. It's a weird arrest. It's a weird arrest. <laughs> yeah. It's. Yeah. That, that's all you can really say. Just. Uh, Really bizarre, especially a weird thing to wake up to or not wake up to. This is at noon, but on noon on a Monday is uh, just weird, really weird. And then uh, Austin Riley's going to miss six to eight weeks with a fractured hand um, for the Braves. So big loss for them. They're they're already kind of struggling. I, I think the stat was it's been like four years or something since the Braves were not in a playoff spot. Like at some point in the standings, I think you probably, I think you might've mentioned that. Yeah, they, I don't, I, I don't know if I mentioned that. I know that that's definitely true. I mean, they've been, they, they built back up, you know, they had some lean years in the mid 2010s, I think, um, about four by my estimation. And, uh, and they have dealt with a rash of injuries this year. And if people feel like maybe they could do what they did in 2021, which saw them lose Acuna for the year and Strider was a rookie, basically a non-factor. Um, but now without Riley, uh, Ozzy Albies is out. The bullpen has been, you know, okay. I mean, and Chris Sale, obviously having an amazing year, they just activated Ronaldo Lopez, but they are sliding fast and it's not a given that they're going to get in. Um, the Mets are there. There's a couple teams sort of lurking like the giants, maybe perhaps. Um, but you got, you know, I don't know, four and five seeds are looking like they're probably out of reach for Atlanta. So they've got to hold on to that last spot. But losing Riley's, that, that's big. That hurts. Yeah. Um, they are two games up on the Mets right now. Yeah, two games up on the Mets, which the Mets are the Mets. Uh, we we kind of, we already know. They lost one, two, three, four, five, six straight um, just a few weeks ago. Um, that ended with the Rockies. They did beat the Rockies. So I love the, I like it when the Braves are good. It feels like the nineties, you mm -hmm. know, it just like, it just feels like it. I like what, you know, when Chipper Jones was there, I love those old, like late thousands, early 2010s Braves teams. And then they suck for a while, but it's always fun when the Braves are good. I would rather have them kind of battling it out for a playoff spot, playing a lot of meaningful games versus being the best team in baseball and then not playing meaningful games down the stretch because they've already clinched the one seed so early. Let's. Yeah, let, let's stay. Let's stay on baseball. The Yankees lost two of three to the Tigers this weekend. I thought that was a kind of a big spot. Those are games you feel like they should be winning. Just as a, you know, they're they're a perennial number one. They're they're competing for a World Series right now, and they're out here losing games to the White Sox. They went three and three versus the Tigers and the White Sox in the last six. Not encouraging for the Yankees. I mean, yeah, and before that, they went through a stretch where they were playing pretty mediocre uh, against mediocre teams, right? They had, I think they uh, lost two out of three to the Angels and they took two out of three from the Rangers. So they actually, and then lost or won two out of three against 
the Jays. So they've basically played 500 ball against a, uh, all non-playoff teams this month. Yeah. And I think the biggest sucker bet in all of baseball right now is betting the Yankees as the prohibitive favorite to win the American League. And I think the second favorite to win the World Series. I mean, I don't care that they have the top run differential in baseball. You know, sometimes it's a great stat. Sometimes it's completely misleading. Uh, to me, the Yankees feel like a two-man show. Maybe three when, when Chisholm's in there. But Soto and Judge, the rest of the lineup just is not producing at all. There's nobody that scares you in that lineup. I mean, the starting pitching has been solid. Cole looks more like himself. Stroman pitched well last night. Clay Holmes has 10 blown saves. He's, he's got a sub three ERA, which is crazy, but that's also telling me that they're forcing him probably into a few games earlier than he needs to be as well, because they don't trust the rest of the bullpen guys like Leiter and Canely. I mean, I, they don't, it's not that dominant bullpen they had a few years back when it was like Miller, Chapman and Batances, you know, they don't have guys like David Robertson back there. I, you know, obviously the days of Mariano Rivera are long gone. So yeah, uh, they, you know, it bodes well for the Orioles, you know, that they haven't really taken advantage of the Yankees mediocre play this month yet. So they're tied with, I, I don't know, what is it? With 37, 36, 37 games to go. I, I feel like, and I'm not just saying this as a biased Orioles fan. I feel like the Orioles are the better team. Doesn't mean they'll win the division necessarily, but I just, I cannot see this Yankees team making serious noise in the playoffs. I just can't. I, I think the Ales in general, the AL is down in general this year. I, I feel like, you know, I'd be just as nonplussed by the Royals or the Twins winning the pennant as I would by the Yankees winning it mm -hmm. at this point. So, um, and, you know, I mean, like the Yankees swept the Tigers earlier this year. So if at the end of the season you look and say, well, they, you know, they went four and two against the Tigers. Okay, they did what they were supposed to do, but they're not playing well in a very advantageous stretch of their schedule right now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the games you have to win, they're, they're just, they just can't win them. I mean, you, you look right. at how the Yankees played earlier in the year. I think they had probably a lighter schedule at the beginning of the year. You can probably attribute it that to, to the, to that big run that they had. Um, they had, you know, six against Detroit and Chicago and they took all six. And now here we are in the time where you really need to win ball games. You're tied with, with the Orioles and you're losing series to the Tigers. You're getting walked off on a literal little league field against against the Detroit Tigers. And yeah. That's not what a playoff team is doing. In, uh, no, in their last fifty five games, they're twenty four and thirty one. Okay, that's a th that's one game more than a third of a season worth of baseball, and it's not the first third of the season where you know we've seen that in you know, like the Nats when they were nineteen and thirty one and then played amazing for the last you know hundred twelve games. But the Yankees are seven games under 500 for basically the last two months. It all started with a Holmes blown save. They walk, got walked off by the Royals. They were trying to get a four game sweep and they have not been the same team since. Yeah. Let's go. Uh, let's stay in the American league. East. Red Sox and Orioles had a big series this weekend. Um, and the Red Sox actually took two of four. Now the big problem that I had predicted at the beginning of the year for the Red Sox and it wasn't exactly an issue to start the year, was the pitching and specifically the bullpen. The Red Sox bullpen is atrocious. They are so bad. I, it feels like they have to score 10 runs a game just to win, just to win a ball or even tie, you know, just to go to extras. Um, they are so bad. But the Red Sox actually take two of four from the O's. That's, that's the best case scenario as a Red Sox fan, taking two of four from you guys. You guys have dominated us. Uh, over the last couple of years, it feels like and taking two of four in August over a first place team is extremely, extremely like confidence boosting for me. Well, it's crazy because yesterday's game, the, the Orioles won four to two. The Red Sox out hit mm -hmm. the Orioles 11 to three. Yeah. <laughs> they went one for 14 with runners in scoring position and left 11 men on base. Uh, but it wasn't until, you know, they didn't even get their second run or their, their first run until the eighth inning. And then they got a solo homer in the ninth. Yeah, I, I think, look, I mean, you can answer this question better than I can. If I told you the Red Sox were going to be seven games over 500 on August 19th, given what they didn't do in the offseason, would you have taken that? And they're still very much in the thick of, I think, it more in the thick of the wild card at this point than the AL East race. And they just, you know, you get a four game split in Baltimore. They got. A bunch of runs, I don't remember exactly, I think it was eight runs off Corbin Burns the other night, who I, 
much as I like that they have a a so-called ace, I'm I'm not the most sold on Corbin Burns. I, I don't know what it is, but there's something I just don't quite trust about him as the ace. But the Red Sox really just offensively went to town in that game. They put up, I think, 12. I think it was 12 to 10, right? It was the first game or second game 10, in the series. Yeah, we, had, we actually so, almost blew the lead. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the Orioles chipped away. Um, so, yeah, pitching predictably uh, has been a problem. I mean, guys, some of the guys look like they've hit a wall, like Cutter Crawford, although he didn't pitch badly yesterday at all. But the bullpen, you know, has struggled. They, they've had a few opener games that haven't been pretty. I think that yeah. was the 12 to 10 game. I think that was the opener. They used the opener. In that. Uh, yeah. Cooper. Well, Cooper Criswell came in, pitched like five got shelled six, yeah. six earned on uh, 3.1. So yeah. really not good. He, he's a listed starter in the finale against Houston, which scares me because um, they play the Astros this week. So they, you know, they just got swept by the Astros at home last weekend you know, that, mm-hmm. that weird thing MLB does with the schedule now where you have a lot of these, you know, where the two teams play like two out of three series, basically. They play back-to-back weeks. Just the yeah. whole nature of the unbalanced weird. or balanced. Really schedule. weird. It is very weird. I don't like it at all. But the Red Sox, they have to they have to play well in this series. I think they have to win yeah. this series because if they lose, they start losing ground. They lose, You lose confidence. I mean, because Houston, like you think about it, if the Red Sox get in, they're probably going to be the sixth seed. And the way it's shaping up, they would face Houston probably in the first round in that wild card round, if Houston doesn't steal a buy, which I'm afraid that they still might, but you know, this is a big, a big stretch, I think coming up, you know, for the Red Sox. Uh, and it starts, you know, this week, obviously. And, and then after they've got Arizona coming in. Um, so I think you might learn a lot about Boston this week, see if their pitching can hold up. And then for the Orioles, I mean, the big thing for them was, was was their starting pitching depth going to hold up because of all the injuries they've had there this year? Now Grayson Rodriguez adds that list, and they're hoping they can get him back. Um, and Burns obviously not pitching well, but a guy that's really been, you know, talk about a, a great trade. I mean, if Trevor Rogers going tonight, which looks like a terrible trade thus far, giving up Stowers and Norby, but Zach Eflin's been tremendous. And so has Sir Anthony Dominguez. I mean, you've thankfully – mercifully they ended the Craig Kimbrell closing experiment. I mean, he's coming into games earlier and earlier at this point yeah. um, because they just cannot trust him with any kind of high leverage situation. But, um, and, you know, and, and the Orioles for as good as they are and as, as talented as they are, the thing that also worries me is that they're pretty reliant on the home run, which, you know, yeah. obviously that was the case yesterday. They got two home runs. They had three hits and it was enough because their pitching made it stand up and, kept the Red Sox from scoring in a bunch of situations, but you can't, it's really hard to win and have consistent offense in the playoffs when you're so dependent on the long ball. Yeah. Um, the Red Sox after Houston and Arizona, the schedule does lighten up a little bit. You it get does. Toronto yeah. for four, which are divisional, you know, divisional matchups. Those are a little more difficult, I think. So it's not super light, but then you get in Detroit and at the Mets and then versus Chicago. Um, and then the final few weeks of September get really tough with Baltimore, New York, in Tampa, which is always, always a battle. I don't give a shit who you are, who Tampa has. It's still a battle. Um, Minnesota again. Yeah, Minnesota. And then you get Toronto and then Tampa in Boston to end it. So uh, we might be making our way up to Boston for that final series. So look out for some some good content. Well, I might be. Um for that final series, you might have a clinching game. That that final series, you never know. Can we but throw? Gonna... What's that? Can we throw in one crazy play that happened yesterday that they said was the first in MLB history? The double play, yeah, the, the eight, eight nine, eight, nine, nine forty two double play by the yeah. Marlins, and, 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 and they run the run they cut off the plate. They ended up winning the game by a run. So there you go. They Something said it was the first time, is, yeah, since at least nineteen hundred. Yes, yes. And the point is, you go to a baseball game and never know. You may see something that you've never seen before. Literally. Yeah, that's it is it is one of the weird sports where you can have those weird those weird stats that it, it has literally never happened or it hasn't happened in a century. Yeah. And um, the Mets themselves just played the longest pitch clock era game uh, earlier this week, I think, against Oakland. It was like three hours and 45 minute nine inning oh, game. That, that sounds like torture for any. <laughs> Any person it was a who's day game. I'm it. sure it was hot out. Uh, you know, <laughs> playing Oakland. Yeah. 
I mean, who wants to watch the Mets for that long? Nobody wants to, not even Mets fans want to watch yeah. the Mets for that yeah. long. Um, we'll, we'll go to, we'll get to the Mets in a minute. Go to the central here. The twins are, and the Royals are hot on the Guardians tail right now. I mean, I think weren't the, didn't the Guardians have the best record in the American League at some point this year? And well, it seems like there have been like eight different teams that have had the best record in baseball at some point this year, the way it's going. <laughs> yes, they did. They're sliding. Keep in mind, the Guardians have only gone five and five against the White Sox this year. I mean, you want to look at one stat that might scare the hell out of you if you're a Guardians fan, beside the fact that they have the longest active title drought in baseball, which, you know, the Cubs took that from them when they beat them in 2016. Um, I think there were a lot of legitimate concerns about the Guardians at the deadline, and they didn't really address many of them. I mean, their big addition was um, Lane Thomas from the Nats, but they did not address their starting pitching at all. They do not have anybody representing a bona fide ace at this point. They're very dependent on their bullpen. Um, they were getting a lot of contributions from maybe some unexpected sources, guys that were playing above their, punching above their weight, so to speak, or speak early in the year. Um, they're coming back to earth. I'm not saying that they're totally fraudulent. I think they're a mm -hmm. solid team. I just don't believe they're a championship caliber team. Um, but I, and I forget if I've said this before about the twins. I know I've thought it many times. I've spoken highly of the Royals. Um, and I, I believe they could be dangerous just because, you know, they're young, they have no expectations and they've got the best or second best player in the American league right now. But for all the years that the Twins have just sucked and sucked up a playoff spot and wasted it and been so pathetically, not even lovable because it's beyond that, but just rolling over constantly to the Yankees in the playoffs. If there ever was a year for the Twins to really take a step forward, it's now. I mean, the rest of the league, they have not elevated to the rest of the league. The rest of the league has just fallen to them. But I think that they're playing really good baseball. And I think that if they get the confidence of maybe getting a first round bye and they get healthy, this, this could, this could be their one window where the AL is within their grasp. I, I, I believe that they have to take advantage of it this year. If they're going to stay in this rut of mediocrity and not rebuild, but not really spend to get better, this would be the year. Yeah. Um, I think if, you got to give the Royals a shot. I think if, if God was a baseball fan, he would, he would, he, you know, like, this is incredibly blasphemous. And any person who's religious, don't listen to me. The baseball gods, if they wanted baseball. the best result, I mean, you would, you would have the Royals go on a run and win this thing, right? Like they are the most exciting team. Well, to, out of we, the central, in my opinion. Does Kansas City need another parade? Right. I mean, we've watched enough of the chase. Taylor Swift going to be at any of the Royals game. We know figured Kelsey and Mahomes would probably be there. You Mahomes know. definitely. He owns them. Well, he's right? part, he's owner, part yes, owner, of course. Uh, and Kelsey, you know, he showed up at the World Series last year and it was Arizona and Texas. You know, guys <laughs> all over the place. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, the Royals, they are. They they like for them, they need to get their quote unquote other guys to perform. Like Vinny Pasquantino is having a great year. Sal Perez has had a renaissance. This uh, uh, Blanco has had a few monster games recently. Their starting pitching's good. I mean, will it hold up? You know that that's the big test is whether Seth Lugo's. You know, he he struggled recently. He was great early in the year. Uh, Brady Singer. I mean, their bullpen's been questionable, but getting Lucas Ur Urseg was huge. He's been lights out uh, since they got him. They that was an area of need for them. Again, I just reiterate the american league is very very much up for the taking for i think anybody that gets in legitimately you can make a case uh for them winning and that includes the yankees who i was just ripping on i mean that's and that maybe that's why they are still the favorite just because they figured they're the yankees and the league stinks and the twin you know they might face the twins who that's an automatic win for them right yeah um but yeah, that would be fun. It would be fun to see the Royals. I mean, as much as I don't like want to see Kansas City win again, and I don't want the Royals to take out the Orioles the way they did a decade ago, um, I think it would be fun to see Bobby Witt on a playoff stage for sure. And again, yeah. like when the Royals made it in 2014, they hadn't been there in 29 years. Now it's been nine years. It's not as long a drought. But again, you, mean, you saw last year, right? Texas, they hadn't been there in seven years, tore through the postseason. So I don't know. Experience might be overrated. Yeah. Might be a lot. Um, 
And then to the West, this is the perfect experience versus no experience. The Mariners are falling fast. I oh, mean, you could have seen and, that coming. Jeez. But is is it more the Mariners are falling fast, or is it Houston is just on a fucking tear? I think it's a little bit of both. I think both teams are they're moving in the opposite directions very quickly. Okay, it's both. I have a friend from Seattle who's always. He said, you know, it's fair to wonder if over the years the Mariners have always collapsed in the second half because they travel more than any other team. And does that take its toll on them? I don't think that's the case this year. I think all the offensive metrics were pointing towards a massive collapse. They were just getting by early in the year. The the pitching staff, they just can't bear the weight of carrying the entire team the entire season. And the Mariners are, have the most strikeouts. They have the lowest batting average. They go out, they get a guy like Randy Rosarena, who, yeah, on paper, that's exciting. His average was right around where the team's average was. It's not like they went out and they got a guy who maybe has no power, but it's going to hit 300 and get on base, which is really, I think, what they need as much as they need power. Um, I, I just cannot believe they're wasting a starting pitching staff of this caliber. Maybe the best or one of the best rotations, one to five, in baseball for the Mariners. Bullpen, eh. I mean, Andres Munoz has been great as a closer. It's been getting to him that's been a problem. I think the Mariners are just going to continue for the most part on this path. They're maddeningly inconsistent. And the Astros are kind of like the Chiefs, right? Where it doesn't matter what kind of start they get off to. It doesn't matter how many people count them out. They feel inevitable. They play their best baseball when they need to. And it's not always in September. Last year, remember, they really scuffled down the stretch and recovered yeah. just in time swept the Diamondbacks the last weekend of the year and got the division. And now they've paced themselves perfectly. You know, they're four games. They, they went from being down 10 games on June 18th to being up four games on August 18th. Think about that. A 14-game swing in the American League West standings in a span of two months. Now, the Mariners, no team had ever blown a 10-game lead that fast when the division lead disappeared. And now just looking at that swing, I mean, it is, it is incredible. I hope it's more that the Mariners are bad than the Astros are good, because if the Astros are good this year, in a year, like I said, where the AL is down, look out. Yeah, they might be able to just snag their, what is it, their third title now? Like just very quietly. Like eighth straight steal. American League Championship Series appearance if they get there. And they get Kikuchi, who had a bad ERA, and... Lo and behold, the guy's been lights out. Same thing for the Dodgers with Kopech. Guy comes over, and you know Kopech was obviously a big prospect with the Red Sox. Comes over with like a four-something ERA. He's given up one hit in like 10 innings. I mean, give me a break. And I don't know. Kikuchi, Kikuchi had a lot of um, career. He had clicked. This was his, a career year for a lot of stats besides his ERA. Like I think his whip, his whip was really good. He had a lot of very good you know, of like the deeper stats. Right. It's just the they ERA mean. didn't look good. So I think he got a little undervalued over in Toronto. Yeah. But uh, look out for the Astros. Yeah. Um, to the NL East, the New York Mets had the hawk to a girl throughout the first pitch. And they oh. literally hawk to it. I hate, I hate the hawk to a thing. First off, I think it's so stupid. It's not even funny. They they blew their lead. They they literally spit on their lead. I mean, listen, the hawk to a girl. I'm glad she's making money. I'm glad she's doing a good thing. She's helping animals, you know. Um, I thought it was a little weird having her throw out the first pitch, to be honest. It was just, you know, there, there's a lot of kids there. And it's yeah. maybe it's maybe it's me being, you know, like a little too sensitive. But I, I just think it's a little weird to, you know, bring her out like that. But uh, yeah. It's just, this is the Mets. It's, it's, and every Mets fan was like, we're not mad because it was the Hawk Tua girl. We're mad because they're paying attention to Hawk Tua while other teams are paying attention to baseball and trying to win baseball games. And we are, we have a 22% chance to make the playoffs right now. <laughs> what the fuck yeah. are we doing? I mean, the Mets do, they do this all the time where they get off to a bad start and then they have this one incredible surge that kind of makes everyone believe they're the Jets. And right, and then they run out of steam. And they, I mean, if they get there, or if they get in this year, which they could, because only because the Braves are scuffling so much, they're not. They're not a bad team, but they're not a championship caliber team. Which is why it was interesting with direct what direction they were going to go at the deadline. Like I didn't think they were going to be sellers necessarily, but I wouldn't have faulted them if they had, if they had decided to maybe trade Alonzo. Pick. I mean, they need to. 
beef up their farm system, you know? Um, yeah. And they were able to do that a little bit with the Verlander and Scherzer trades last year. And I think they need to continue on that path. Um, but get, I, I get it's funny. I mean, they're, it's still a New York team. They might be quote unquote little brother, but they're still the Mets. So they can kind of get away with these shenanigans and it's all fun and games. But, um, but yeah, it's like, hey, we got a playoff race to, to focus on now. I mean, we're only two games out of this wild card. And hey, if they get in, you know, they'll be as the six seed. They would play the Brewers. And that's a team that doesn't really ever win in the postseason. So maybe they feel like, hey, maybe they could get a couple games at City Field in the postseason, which would be a big deal. I mean, I think for them, it'd have to be a victory just getting into the postseason, let alone getting some home games. But, uh, but they're not going to win the division. The Phillies are and i think the phillies are if we're just talking at least it's interesting because they they had a really bad stretch of baseball which you know if you're a philly fan you want to yell and boo and cry and say this is typical philly but i think if you know how baseball works sometimes and not all the time teams that have these mid-season swoons that are really good it's not the worst thing in the world because law of averages dictate that they're going to come back and they're going to recover and we know the phillies are the kind of team they've shown us the last two years that that save their best for October. And maybe that's what they're, I'm not saying that they're trying not to win, but they are not prioritizing going full speed right now. They've dealt with some injuries throughout. They seem to be coming back around a little bit. They've won, I think four out of five, you know, they, they beat the Mets. I'm not the Mets. I'm sorry. The, uh, Mar uh, the nationals beat the Marlins before that. So I'm curious just to see how they, how they play over these last couple of years. Do they keep swooning or do they kind of, come back on that upswing and look more like the team we saw in May and June uh, and then carry that into the postseason. I, I think especially with the Phillies more than any, almost any other team this year, their fans freaking out is like freaking out about an NFL preseason game, you know, like looking it's you're in August and maybe late July and you're struggling. Like you're, of course they're not going to value this because you know where you're going. You know that you need to save a little that a bit more of that energy. I'm sure that's what they're doing. I don't think they're going out there giving 100 percent in on, on July 27th. You know, against the fucking Marlins, they don't give a shit. They, they're like, eh, it's what's a few games as long as we get the buy. I think that's really all they care about. Um, but yeah. I, I want to talk about a team that nobody's talking about: the Milwaukee Brewers. They have the biggest lead for the division in the league. They have an 11-game lead over the Cardinals, and it feels like they are the third fiddle, the <laughs> like the you know just the worst worst first place team. Even though I mean they're just not a bad baseball team. They're 72 and 52. It's not like they're you know it's not like they're the Astros at 67 and 56. Um, they are a pretty good baseball team. Well, again, and I said this earlier about the Yankees, the Brewers have the best run differential of all the National League teams at plus 106. Now, you know, in fairness, the Phillies and especially the Dodgers have, have dealt with injuries. The Dodgers were without bets for a little while. Milwaukee and now losing Christian Yelich, right? And that was like a big deal. A few weeks ago, he was shut down and, and now we know he, he's having, you know, he had back surgery and he's going to miss the rest of the season. They, yeah. they played without him down the stretch in 2019 and got to the postseason. Obviously, he was the MVP and a big part of why they went to the NLCS in 18. They are... Um, Kind of an amazing story uh, because they traded Corbin Burns. And I think when they did that, people kind of thought, okay, they're kind of, yeah, we're not going to expect much. They're kind of in a semi-rebuild. Again, they're like the twins where they don't, they're not going into that full rebuild. They're kind of content to just stay pretty competitive. Um, but as crazy as it sounds, they are tied right now in the loss column with the Dodgers for what would be the second seed. Now, I don't see in any scenario the Brewers – playing to the level of both the Phillies or to either, I should say, either the Phillies or the Dodgers to get a first round buy. But as you pointed out, they have a very healthy division lead. It'll be interesting to see how they sort of approach the stretch run because for all intents and purposes, they're a lock to win the division. So we know they're going to be in the postseason. Do they really push hard and put pressure on themselves to try to get a first round buy, or do they just say, Hey, let's, let's prioritize being healthy, seeing what some of our young guys can do. Now, last year they were the three seed, they won their division and they were swept in a couple games by Arizona. So they may be thinking more along the lines of let's not fall into that wild card spot again. 
We know what that can do. But uh, yeah, I mean, I've been impressed, especially in the absence of Yelich. Um, they got some exciting players. They got Bryce Terang steals a ton of bases. William Contreras looks like he's coming back up. He was in a bit of a slump. Looks like the better Contreras brother, I got to say, too, after watching a little bit of Wilson <laughs> over the weekend. Looks like the better Contreras brother. Um, yeah. But yeah, and the Brewers are also have been a really good home team this year. 38-24 at, oh, I call it Miller Park. I don't care that it's American Family Field. Or as I heard one of the announcers called this weird Am I think AmFam Field or AmFam Stadium or Am whatever. AmFam, yeah. <laughs> so, hey, but good on the Brewers. Uh, Look, for being in it, I mean, but I, I don't know how seriously I take them as a as a team that can make a deep run. Yeah. Um, and then to the West. So I actually am going to compare this more to the American League Central. I think you can put the Dodgers more as the guardians here. They've let this kind of become a race. And and you did a video on it. Go check out Draft America, YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok. Uh, Mike did a, quick, or did a quick video on it. They have let this thing become a race. The Padres are now three games out, and the Diamondbacks are four games out of first place right now. Yeah, it well, it got down to two before the weekend. And as I pointed out in that clip, don't want to give out too many spoilers, but you have two teams playing an, at an incredibly high clip right now in the Padres and Diamondbacks. That's not really sustainable. So for the Dodgers, and, you know, I think it's about winning series and kind of pacing themselves, which is interesting because in years past, we've seen the Dodgers just go on these tears. And who knows, maybe that takes something out of them in the postseason, maybe it doesn't. They've been a little more of kind of a, steady as she goes, just trying to be healthy as they go towards the postseason. I think what I when I look at the National League, and it looks kind of just as bunched and tight as the American League, but I kind of see it as the opposite in the National League, where I really feel like for as close as the records look right now, as close as the NL West has gotten, that the Dodgers and Phillies come playoff time will elevate to a different level. And I think as as strong as the Diamondbacks and Padres have looked recently, um, and even the Brewers, I, I just, I don't know if in October with those teams getting held, I mean, barring a big slew of injuries, you know, like if Otani goes down or Harper's out or something, you know, I just, I feel like those teams, whatever the records are, even if one of them falls out of a bye, I just, I feel like the more I think about it, the more likely, I feel, especially because the last two years in the National League, both the one and two seeds have lost in the division series. And I'm just sort of playing law of averages here. Maybe there's no logic behind it, but I feel like that's very unlikely to happen yet again. And I think the Dodgers will find a way to win the NL West because I just, I, as much as them, maybe just, you know, as it is about them, I think that Arizona and San Diego are going to come back to earth. And remember that Here's San Diego the, has a better record against the Dodgers this year than they do against the Rockies. And that always sums up the Padres perfectly. Here's the crazy thing, too, with the Dodgers. We, we've, we've talked about they get everyone. They're, they trade for everyone. Yeah. They buy everything. Their pitching staff, they might bolster it even more come the playoffs with Shohei. Shohei might be back. Wow. I They're talking about him coming back. Yeah, that would be pretty terrifying, wouldn't it? You know, I mean, they, well, I would think they got to worry about getting Yamamoto back first. And I think he will yeah. be back before season's end. I think Glasnow going in the IL, as much as everyone wants to jump on that and say typical Glasnow, I think that was precautionary. I think everything they're doing right now is precautionary. They just lost River Ryan, but, you know, Kershaw is still good. And I know you make people make their jokes about playoff Kershaw is different, whatever. But in terms of getting there, there's never been a doubt in anyone's mind about regular season Kershaw, and he looks like he hasn't skipped a beat. He's just learned how to pitch where his velocity has dropped off. Yeah. Um, you know, they're still the only, So, yeah, his last outing, he went six innings, no earned runs, and only two strikeouts, and everyone was kind of jumping all over Major League Baseball for posting that. They, like, po you know, they posted his stat line, and they were like, oh, Kershaw's back. I was like, first off, it doesn't matter how you get the outs. Just get the fucking outs. And he clearly does have to change. He's not going to blow these guys away anymore. He's just too old. He's not going to blow them away. He's not going to do what he's able to do. But if he's able to get the outs, six innings, I'll take six innings of, of two hit or one hit ball with, with two Ks and no runs. I mean, that's pretty damn good. Yeah. Yeah. And, they, and, and again, we 
mentioned Flaherty was a guy they picked up and he's been really good. Of course he has. And Kopech of course has found that, you know, next level and they just brought back Ryan Brazier and they're going to get Trinan back and they may get Gratterall back as bad as that injury looked. It, it was downgraded from a grade three to a grade one hamstring strain. Um, I mean, the Shohei thing would be, that would be almost potentially next level, but they are looking at getting back Max Muncy and Tommy Edmond, who they also traded for. I mean, they spent a, a billion dollars and they still go out and trade for three pretty good players at the deadline. Yeah, before, um, so we'll we'll go to the grid after this, but the uh, quote from ESPN is possibly better than he was before for Shohei um, road to road back to pitching. So not good. And then I also, I, I do want to go back to this. These were our preseason predictions for the playoffs. I had Orioles and Rangers. Orioles beat the Rangers and then Phillies over Dodgers in the NLCS. Um, mm. And then the Phillies win the World Series, um, which I did follow your pattern of Celtics and Phillies. You had Astros, Orioles, Astros over the Orioles, and then Dodgers over the Braves. And then we have the Dodgers beating the Astros in the rematch. Um, so pretty interesting. I think we're, you know, I, I actually wasn't very close. Yeah. Rangers are probably not happening, but. <laughs> no, no. We, well, we, well, we got them last year. We picked them last year. And yeah. so uh, we, we got that right at, at midseason. So. All right. We, we're going to do the football grid today because we didn't talk all that much football. Probably have about five minutes just for the listeners. Um, this one is a good one. I'm excited about this one. We got the Colts. That's, that's the most important thing. We got the Colts. Yeah. That's going to be a tough one. Honestly, the, the Colts Lions will be kind of tough. I'm going to have to really think about that one. Um, well, I remember that Reggie Wayne signed with the Patriots, but then he never played. Um, he was only on the practice squad. Only yeah. The practice squad. Um, you could do Jacoby Brissett here or here. Either that's, one. He did appear that's for both true. teams. So I got to think of a Patriot slash Redskins slash Commander slash Washington football well, team. Dwayne Allen is here. I'm going to go Dwayne Allen. Oh, yeah, tight end. That's right. Because then I can also go Jacoby Brissett here. Because I think yeah. I think a football team and Patriots is a lot tougher of a, <laughs> you know, a lot tougher. Of I mean, and you can go any which way for the for the sacks. I think you could go with, uh, let's see, Ennis, Wable. I think they all, Seymour, they would all have had 10 sacks. Judon, I mean, it's Judon if we're thinking – Recently, Chandler, I mean, Chandler Jones, obviously. that's that one I'm 1,000% oh, yeah. sure of uh, is Chandler Jones. And we know that he's, we don't have to worry about a Patriot Raider or a Patriot Cardinal. So I think we can go with Chandler. Yeah. Um, Lions, 10 plus sacks. Ooh, think about that. Who's the Lions big? Uh, hey, well, the Hutchinson, did he have, did he get to 10? I don't know. I'm not sure if he did. Who did he? He had to have, because he played, I mean, he had a great year. Like he had a very... Good year. I feel like he definitely did. I feel, I mean, now they play 17 games. Ndamukong and Sue? Did, did Sue oh, ever have yeah, 10? Yeah, Ndamukong and Sue, absolutely. Yeah, I think he can go with. Yeah, what a picture. What a forehead. Eagles, I mean, well, of course, they set the record for sacks a couple of years ago. So who do we go with? Uh, uh, who had the most? Was it Reddick? Was it, it wasn't Graham? Was it they had like a bunch of players that had. It was. I mean, I think Hassan uh, Reddick would just be the safest uh, choice yeah, there. There we go. All right. The, the Eagle, Colts, well, well, Eagles, Eagles Commanders is easy, I think. Oh, yeah. There's a bunch. You could go there. Um, you was, could go Mariota. Actually, not Mariota because he hasn't played. Because they haven't yet. started. I was just going to say Deshaun Jackson. I mean, that's. That's a good one. Um, trying to think of something smaller. What about. Uh, there has to be a running back. Brian, well, Brian Mitchell, yeah, Brian Mitchell. He returned punts for a long uh, and kicks a long time for the uh, Redskins and the Eagles, and now works for the Redskins. I actually I is it remember this seeing Brian him Mitchell? DC. It would be Brian Mitchell. Yes, it would be that one. Actually, played for the Giants his last year, um, and then Lions. Oh well, this one I could get easily. Gus Farratt, he could throw in there. All right, Colts. Eagles, I don't know why I'm blanking on the receiver that I want to use here. Um, I could always go Nick Foles. I could yes. go yes, Nick Foles. Uh, Tyler Goodson as well. You could, you could go uh, – oh, no, sorry. Never mind. I was thinking something else. 
I could go, who was the tight end that caught the, or threw the Philly Philly? Burton, Trey Burton. Trey Burton, he did play for the Colts for a period of time. Um, I'm going to go with him. I think that's a pretty low number. Yeah, I wouldn't have thought of Trey Burton. Um, Foles is, a, I'm sure, a pretty popular one. There you go. Only one reason I know that is because of Frank Reich. Frank Reich yeah, brought a lot of his kind of pieces over. Then Lions, Colts. Let me, hmm. ah, shit. Okay. Did Orlovsky ever play for the Colts? Oh, he did. He did. I'm he pretty did. sure he did. He played, and I know he was on the 0 and 16 Lions. You would know better than me. I just feel like he played for the Colts. You know what? He did. He did. In the year did, that Manning was hurt, I'm pretty sure he was did, there. Did back. Curtis Painter ever play for the Lions as well? I feel like Curtis Painter yeah, would be that. A I don't one. know, but I do know that Orlovsky was on the 2011 Colts, and he was on the 2008 Lions. So that one I'm I'm positive of. I'm pretty sure Orlovsky almost beat the Brady Patriots that year. Yeah, as well, yeah. In 2011, yeah. Yeah, that's hilarious. Close. Yeah. So I think you can get, there. You go. That yeah, was a popular one, Orlovsky. Rarity score 158. I don't. I don't even know what's what's a good rarity score. Is it like under a certain? Is it? Under? <laughs> I don't know. You can click see what you're ranking. I mean, it might give you what a, what percentile you're in. Average score, score six point four. I don't know what that means in terms of how many people get right. Popular. See the most popular. Oh, geez, yeah, Vinatieri. LeBron, <laughs> of course. Reggie White Foles. too. I don't know how we didn't think about that one. Yeah, well, yeah, of course. And Hutchinson did. Oh, get AP. Yeah, but I never think of Adrian Peterson as a lion. I mean, I I do remember oh, him yeah. more in Washington and obviously, you know, Minnesota. And was he with? Seattle for a minute too. I mean, he bounced around. Oh, he a did. Lot. That was weird. That was really weird. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, Brissett. Okay, so we got the most common one there. Yeah, not bad. And Deshaun Jackson. Uh, yeah. Okay. Here we go. Player scores. I don't. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what any of these numbers mean. Oh yeah, and then uh, Stefan Gilmore as well uh, did sign with the Vikings after a long time. Speaking of guys who played for the Colts and the Patriots, yeah, uh, right. really. I mean, I'm just pissed off. We didn't we didn't go out and sign him. We could have. Uh, yeah, there, there was a few other guys that just got signed this week that the Colts did not sign for their secondary. And our secondary, I know it's a preseason. Secondaries look like shit. So yeah, there were a lot of defensive backs that. We're unsigned for a long time. Remember, I think Patrick Peterson was talking about that. I'm not sure if he, if he even signed yet, but there was just a, a long period of time where none of the DBs had, had found homes. Um, my my biggest concern for this Colts team was the secondary. And, you know, I think some people know I do Unstable. They go on their show every once in a while. And uh, they were telling me that, no, it's actually the front, you know, the front seven, that if they're good, then the secondary will be fine because you're getting to the quarterback quicker. Well, the secondary has really looked like shit in the last two preseason games. But again, it's the preseason. I'm not, you know, I want to wait until the first five, six games, see how the secondary does. But I, I really don't want to be vindicated on my concerns. I really hope I'm not vindicated. I hope I was wrong. I hope that everything turns out peachy. The um, Laitu Latu has looked awesome in the preseason. He's looked dominant. So I'm wrong about that one, although I still think taking a risk on a guy who had Peyton Manning's neck surgeon and was medically retired three years ago, a little high of a risk for a first rounder, for a first rounder. But, you know, I'm stupid and everyone else is smart. Thank you all for watching. Make sure to like, comment, subscribe. We'll be back next week. Uh, we have some big things coming in the next few weeks, I would say. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll wait and hold those. Um, and the documentary will be coming out tentatively summer smash is i'm just delayed it's it's tough to get people to do their interviews but uh just look out for that trailer we'll be dropping within the next couple weeks go vote oscar katz for uh president as well we're putting out some campaign videos for him love oscar the cat he's a pretty cool guy he's a doctor and he's an astronaut so um go check him out make sure to like comment subscribe and we will see you next week